And if I could get you to stay standing, or everyone back up on their feet. All right, we're going to hear the message tonight from a lovely girl, and her name is Sarah Trotson. Hello? Hello? Testing? Yes, we are good to go. There was technical difficulties backstage, but we have worked it out, and we are ready. Well, it's so exciting to be able to share with you all tonight. And just as a quick service announcement, there is a security tag on the back of my jacket. I did buy it, just don't question my integrity, but in the rush of Boxing Day sales, I did not notice till I went to wear it and got here tonight. So that's that, but yes, so off to a good start. But as I said, I'm so excited to share with you all. And as I sat down to prepare for this message, I was on the couch with my laptop out and all of a sudden found myself on Netflix, which was unexpected in a way. But anyways, I decided to watch a David Attenborough special. I thought to myself, if it's educational, it's not procrastination. It's just bettering myself in the break that I take from work. So that's what I did. And, you know, I was watching and there's this cute little bird and I have a photo of him and he's called a sand grouse. And he's a little, oh, well, he's not as blurry as that in real life, but he's a little desert-dwelling bird. And essentially, mum bird stands in the sun all day long with her wings out, shading the little chicks from the sun. And dad bird has to fly a, a long way to any watering hole. And what he does is he gets in the water, he wiggles around a bit, and he has special feathers that work like a sponge and he soaks up all this water and flies it back to the chicks. They live in the middle of nowhere because no one else lives there, AKA predators. Um, still super inconvenient, but that's not my decision. And so that's how the chicks drink. And I was watching this day-to-day -day struggle and uh, it just frustrated me. Like I like convenience and I just was watching thinking, surely there's a better way. Like, move to a rainforest, guys. Move somewhere where there's shade and water. And I thought, don't they dream of something better? Don't they dream of a more relaxed life? But the ironic thing is that I think I live like that a lot of the time, and I think that so do we. We do life day by day. We just survive, and we never stop to think that there might be something better. There might be something more enjoyable, something more something to be more passionate about than just going to work and grumbling, than waiting every day, counting down the minutes, this hand, to go home and to have a weekend. And, you know, I find this so ironic, but the best part for us is that unlike this little, oh, he's gone, unlike the sand grouse, we're not bound to that nature. God has given us the ability to dream. He's given us purpose. He's given us something to aspire to. And we have the ability to leave 2019 or to start and do 2019, not like a sand grouse, doing the same thing every day till we get to the end of the year and it's gone, but to dream and to live a different life, to see a future and bring that into reality. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight because we've been created by the creator in his image. And that sets us apart from the rest of creation. We have been given the ability to create. In Genesis 1 verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God created. That was his very first act. And to me, that says that creation is a big part of God's nature. And it's only natural that we would be creative beings. But as people, we imagine creativity to be the singers, the artists, the dancers among us who are so talented, but the creation we see in Genesis isn't just an outward expression, it's an inward expression. God would have had a vision, would have had a dream of the earth, of the animals, of humanity, and he brought that into existence. The Hebrew word they use is bara, and I'm probably butchering it, but it means to create from nothing. And as his creation, in his image, we have a small part of that. But our creativity lies in that we can create futures. We can see and imagine things that have never been, that we have never experienced, and we can make them a reality in our today. And that's 
that's the future I want to live in, one that I've created, one that I have designed, and one that is something so much greater than what you achieve by just plodding along, doing life as it comes. And, you know, because of dreams like this, there's someone out there who is brave enough to dream of a world without poverty or hunger, and you end up with uh, organizations like Compassion. And, you know, to imagine a world without poverty, that has never existed since the Garden of Eden. But because of that, thousands and thousands of children are living in a world without poverty that wouldn't have been before that. Because of that dream and that vision, the lives of children are being changed. And there are so many dreams in the world today, uh, dreams of a, a free world with no pollution, dreams of end of war, and dreams of peace, things that have never existed in the world again since the beginning of time. But people are working to bring that into reality. And, you know, I wonder sometimes why God lets us handle something quite so powerful. And the only thing I could think of is because God has a dream. And his dream is to see humanity as it was intended. Humanity that is walking with God, that knows love, that knows peace and joy as it was supposed to be. And, you know, he's given us a way to reach that reality. He sent his son Jesus to die for us and he made that path. But we need to choose it. And until we do, that reality is there for us. But if we don't take it, we'll never receive that. And that, I think, would be the biggest shame because it's there for us, a life of love and a life of joy. And when we accept Jesus, we become a part of that vision, of that dream. And we have the opportunity to bring it to the lives of others. Yeah. And so I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I had a dream. I'm sure we all did. And Believe it or not, young Sarah didn't believe of being a tax accountant. No, she definitely did not. Um, she wanted to be a fashion designer. That was her big thing. And, you know, I didn't actually, I'm, well, I'm not a fashion designer, just in case you didn't know, but that dream never changed as I grew older. I did not, I did not regret my job. I love my job, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't imagine a future where I did something different, where I did something more creative, more fun, something that speaks to the passions in my heart. And, you know, I had this dream. It was a great dream until the end, but uh, I was asleep, obviously, unnecessary context, sorry. Um, but in this dream, I was at the end of my life. It was weird, I wasn't old. It was kind of like when your dog turns into a fish in your dream and you don't question it. I was not old, but I was at the end of my life. And I was talking to my boss and I was telling him about all the dreams, all the hopes I had, all the things that I wanted to achieve, but I never did because I didn't want to disappoint him. I didn't know if m my job would be all right if I just walked out. And he went to me, oh, you should have just told me I would have hired somebody else. And I woke up from that dream. Uh, I kind of wanted to cry, but, you know, I don't want to be that person that gets to the end of my life and all they can see is the regrets of dreams they never chased after. I don't want that to be my reality, and I am certain it's not going to be now that I can see that that's a perspective. So, you know, I wonder how many of us have had experiences like that. How many of us have seen a dream, a vision for our lives, but excuses and circumstance overwhelm us. They tell us that we can't. But my question tonight is, what's harder, working towards a dream or a vision not knowing if you'll achieve it, or getting to the end of a long life with a big what if after just doing the day by day? Because when we dream, it's not usually easy. Dreams and the easy path don't usually line up together, unless your dream is to sit on the couch and do nothing. And when, but when we live, creatively, when we live with purpose and for dreams, we're out working the plan of God. And that's where we find purpose. That's where we find that satisfaction, that, that longing that people search for so much. Because when we have the power to dream, it doesn't matter who we are, we have the greatest opportunities to succeed. To succeed. Yeah, yeah. So if we live with purpose and passion, oh, sorry, if we do not live with purpose and passion, then we are just like this sand grouse. We live with no, we just live to survive. We just live to make, make life what it is, make not even lemonade, just make lemons out of lemons. And I just want to say to us, imagine if we got to the end of 2019 and we were able to say that 
we had chased our dreams. We're still chasing our dreams. We are living in a future that at the end of 2018 didn't even exist. And we've created something that now we get to chase after, we get to long for. And, you know, I want 2019 to look like that for me. And I hope that you guys do as well. You know, I want 2019 to be the, the year that we all become daydream believers. And that's the title of my message tonight. And I've written my own term. I am aware it's a very catchy monkey song. I had it in my head all week long. And most of you probably don't know who that is. And I'm not even that old, so I don't know why, that's just me. But it's a fantastic song. But my definition is that a daydream believer is a person who actively seeks to bring their dreams to the day, into reality, who has faith that that that's unseen will become seen and know that they are the creators of their and the futures of those around them. And so we're going to look at this through the story of Joseph tonight. And I love Joseph. You might have heard of him as the king of dreams or Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat. Um, he's quite a well-known Bible story. I think there's a Disney movie about it. And Joseph is a fantastic story because it shows that there's a purpose in the dreams of our heart. It shows that God can use us no matter what our passion is. You know, sometimes people will tell us that our dream is not, isn't, does not align with God, but God is greater than our human thinking. God can use whoever and whatever dream you have to achieve his plan. He can work any sort of miracle through you in anywhere that you want to work hard to succeed in. And so... We're going to look at the story of Joseph tonight. Now, Joseph is the grandson of Abram. Here's a little family tree. He's the grandson of Abraham. He's the grandson of Isaac. And he's the son of Jacob. So Joseph is one of 12 brothers. Um, I have one brother, and that is enough. <laughs> so I don't know how he did it. But anyways, we'll move along. Uh, he's a bit of a favorite child as well, so that's convenient. You could get lost in that many numbers, but his parents make him a beautiful coat. They love him. They adore Joseph. And as you can imagine, his brother's not a big fan of Joseph at all. But he's all in all a pretty normal guy. He's 17. He's a teenager. He just works with his dad's flocks, and he gets his brothers into a bit of trouble by dibber-dobbing on them, as siblings do, but he's just a normal kid until one day he has this dream. And in Genesis 37 verse 7, we see him telling his brothers about it, and he says, we were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. And, you know, they did not like this dream. The Bible says that they hated him all the more for it, and they crushed it. They made fun of him. They told him, essentially, that he was ridiculous. And, you know, I feel for Joseph as a young 17-year-old who's had this incredible dream, and he's just got, you know, 11 or 10 brothers crushing it into the ground. And for some reason, he decides to tell them of the next dream that he has uh, just a little bit later on. And in verse 9, he says, explaining his second dream, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed low before me. Even this time, not just his brothers weren't very happy, but his dad wasn't very happy. He said, do you really expect your mother and I to bow down to you? And he's thinking this favorite son of him is a little bit of a punk. And you know, I wonder what that's like for Joseph. Uh, he's a young guy having these incredible dreams that give him a hope for his future, a hope that's so far removed from the reality that he lives in. And everyone that he knows is telling him it's wrong. They're crushing it into the ground. You know, I wonder if that's happened to any of us here today. Like, have you ever had a dream, uh, something you're so excited about that people have just shut down? They've just said, nope, not going to happen. That's not for you. And I would say, if you have had that, I'm sorry, but that's actually a really good thing. Because the first thing I want to draw out of this story is that we need to dream bigger. In Ephesians 3 verse 20, and Dan has already mentioned this tonight, it says in the Amplified Version, Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do so abundantly more than all we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power, 
that is at work within us. You know, if your dreams don't make you doubt, then they're probably not big enough. You know, we serve a limitless God who can help us to achieve anything. And it says that what you dream, he takes it to the next level. So you want to be dreaming as big as you can because we serve a big God and he has big things for us. You know, he wants us to live with wild expectations that he can come and exceed. And that excites me and that stirs me to have a dream, to have a passion that I want because I know God is going to fulfill that on a level that I can't imagine. And I can imagine a lot of good stuff. Um, And, you know, Joseph didn't have the Bible like we do. He doesn't have this in retrospect. He's living this. And so I think it would be safe to say that he is discouraged. He is getting, having visions from God that people are telling him are wrong. And to interpret dreams was one of his gifts. So I think you would be very confused and feel quite alone in this. And unfortunately for him, things don't get very better much better in the short term. Uh, His brother's hatred ends up getting to them and they had decided to kill him, but one of them thought, "Mm, maybe that's a little harsh. So they just decided to sell him into slavery, which is, you know, that's not so bad. I've, I've never sold my brother into slavery, so I think I'm doing pretty well, but I just think he's 17 and his brothers have just sold him into slavery. So Joseph is now on the way to Egypt He's auctioned off and sold to a person. Now, I can't imagine what that's like to begin with, but to have this dream, this vision, and to be taken so far away from it, from the home you love, from the family you have, everything that could comfort you, would be just destroying. But you know what? God is with Joseph in this, and Joseph ends up doing better than okay. It says in Genesis 39, verses 3 to 4, that Potiphar noticed, uh, Pot- I don't know if I said this, Potiphar is the man that purchased Joseph to be his slave. He is the captain of the Pharaoh's guard. And Potiphar noticed and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. And this pleased Potiphar so. So he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. And You know, the second thing I want to pull out of this is we need to live for the dream and not for the reality that we're in. You know, I don't know if you've heard of the saying, dress for the job you want, not the job you have, but that is what Joseph is doing. You know, if we stop and imagine for a second that we're 17, that, well, some of you are 17, but just imagine that you've just been taken away from your home. You've been sold as a slave. You are not having a good time. And to have the work ethic to do well, to want to achieve something better, something tells me that he wasn't living for his reality. He was living for where he knew God would take him to, to the vision that was in his heart. And that is something that inspires me. That is something that encourages me that no matter where I am, I need to live for the dream. I need to live for what I want to see, not for what I can see. And so Joseph does very well. He ends up being put in charge of the entire household. Potiphar is the only person above Joseph in his house. So he's doing very well. He's one step closer to that dream. And, you know, he's living big. He's dreaming big. He's living for his future. So surely it's got to go pretty smooth from here. But then we meet Potiphar's wife. Now, Potiphar's wife probably liked, or definitely liked Joseph even more than Potiphar did. And she decided that she wanted to sleep with him. He was apparently very attractive. He must have been like Egypt Chris Hemsworth or something, I don't know. But she is very persistent at Joseph, and he stands his ground every time. He wants to respect Potiphar. He wants to respect God, and he pushes her away every time, and she gets sick of it. And one day when she tries to corner him, she ends up grabbing his cloak, his jacket, something like that, and she ends up taking that to her husband and tells him that Joseph had tried to attack her. And fair enough, Potiphar puts him in prison for this. He's not impressed. And so now we see Joseph. He was a young boy with a dream. He became a slave. He worked and became the head of a household. And now he's been thrown into jail. Now, 
if that were me, I think I would be at the end of my dream. I think that would be enough for me to think that I was definitely wrong and that this was as good as it was going to get. And yet Joseph still persisted. He gets... He does so well in prison. Who knew you could do well in prison? But he gets put in charge of everything. It says under Joseph, the warden didn't have to worry about a thing. And for me, I think when you have a vision and a passion from God, something bubbles up, a strength bubbles up, and no matter where you are, you can push. You can be the person you want to be, no matter how many people tell you you're not that. And we see Joseph living his best life in prison, and he decides to use his gift of dream interpretation. There are two prisoners that have a dream, and they're both very troubled by it. Uh, So Joseph offers to interpret these, and Um, one, both were interpreted correctly. One leaves prison and goes back to work for the Pharaoh. The other one, sadly, is impaled and doesn't end very well for him. But Joseph interpreted both of their dreams correctly. And he says, as they are let out of the prison, in Genesis 40, verse 14, "'Only remember me when it's well with you, "'and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, "'and so get me out of this house.'" You know, Joseph knew that one day the dream that God gave him would become reality. But first he had to trust God with a very minor detail of getting him out of prison. You know, if we don't keep God at the center of our dream, we're going to lose hope very quickly because there are things that only God can do. There are situations only God can overcome. And when we have him at the center, not only are we filled with the hope that it will come true, we can see a future where it can come true. We can continue to dream in the hard place because we know God is with us. And, you know, sometimes we like to separate God from our dreams. I think sometimes we think we might not be, our dreams might not be worthy of God. They might be silly. You know, uh, what could God do with this passion? But I remember at the ACC conference we went to, uh, Dr. Erwin McManus said there are so many people who live and who do what they think God wants them to do and aren't happy about it. When in reality, God would probably prefer you do something you are passionate about and let him work through you in the way that only God can. And, you know, I think that's so key because if we don't believe that our passions that God can use them, then we're not going to share our dreams with God. And that is something that is so important to pray with God, to keep him at the front, to be aiming towards him and praying and asking for help in achieving that future. And, you know, from this point, uh, it goes a bit better for our friend Joseph. Uh, He ends up getting out of prison. He gets put second in charge of the whole of Egypt, only the Pharaoh is above him. Uh, He saves the country and his family from famine, and he sees his dream come to pass, his brothers and his father all kneeling to him out of respect because he he was the highest other other than the Pharaoh. And I'm sure you probably think it didn't take very long for his buddy that went back to the palace to tell Pharaoh about Joseph to help him out, but it actually took two years before Joseph was released from prison after he interpreted those dreams. And I wonder how long some of us have been waiting here tonight for our dream. Maybe we've been waiting for two weeks, maybe two years, maybe two decades. And you know, in a room of this size, I would be interested to know how many dreams have been sacrificed over the years because time has taken a toll. We lose faith. We lose hope in what could be. And we forget the God that we serve cares about our heart. He cares about what we dream of and he doesn't forget. I wonder how many times Joseph thought in prison that God had forgotten him, that he was just going to live out the rest of his days there. And in a matter of a day, he is raised from a prison cell to the second in command of the whole of Egypt, seeing his vision in one day, something that he had waited for for over 13 years he was in Egypt. And, you know, that's the power of God and the power of vision. And that's something that I want to see in my 2019, and I hope that you guys want to see in your 2019, because when we fight for dreams, we end up in places we don't expect. We can end up in hard, in long times, and we can wonder how we got there. We can't join the dots. But you know, God's timing is perfect, 
And his plan, it says, is greater than anything we could ever imagine. And it is perfect. And, you know, I'm happy to wait for perfection. I can do that. But we still need that hope, that encouragement. And I think the story of Joseph gives me that. It reminds me that at the very lowest, there is a purpose. And when you hold on to that passion, you're going to make it through and God is going to see you um, experience that dream in your reality. And so I wonder tonight if I could ask you some questions. What is your dream for 2019 and onwards? And is it a God-sized dream? Or are you limiting it to what you think is possible? You know, far too many of us have a dream, have our practical, realistic dream. And you know, with God, this is the one we aim for because this is the power that he has. He's the bigger God. He sees you and he raises you. You know, you want to go as big as you can if that's the life that you dream of because he's going to take you higher. And I want to ask, what can you start doing today to see your dreams come into reality? How can you start living in your future now? I'm sure all of us can think of something that we've been holding on to, something we haven't wanted to do, something we've been nervous to do. What is that? Take that step. Don't let 2019 be the year you look back and wish you had the vision, you had reached it and realized it by that time. And are you including God in your dreams? Are you sharing them with him? Are you praying with him? Are you letting him be a part of that? Because that is something that is so special. You know, God has such a love for us to think that there is a God who has his plan and he would choose to fulfill it through our desires and through our passions where he can. That's a God that has so much love and so much kindness for us. And I would want to share every dream that I had with him if he is willing to do that. And the last question I have is, have you let discouragement overwhelm your dreams? You know, it's never too late. Where do you maybe need to shake off some discouragement and let your dreams come back, re-envision them, let them set a fire inside you that you can't ignore. Let this dream for 2019 be bigger than what it was when you let it fall. And just know that God is going to take that. He is going to run with you if you are willing to put in the work, if you are willing to be faithful and act in every way as if that is where you are headed. Because your dreams will always determine your direction. You might not be able to see how the map of God lines up, but your direction is heading towards that dream when that's how you live. And you know, I'm not trying to say tonight that Every dream you have is going to come true. I'm not going to say that because it, there's some of them probably won't. But God is faithful when we live wholeheartedly. Yeah. When we live with passion, he has purpose for each and every one of us. And it's so much greater than we imagine. And we say that a lot, but it's true. And if you take the time to even think of what you can imagine, imagine what God is dreaming for you. And so, you know, there might be some of us tonight that think we've missed our dream, that think we've broken our dream, but, you know, God has a new dream. God has a new dream for each and every one of us. You can't miss out on a dream in life because it's in the nature of God to have vision, to create, to create our futures, and that requires dreams. And so I wonder if everyone would like to stand in this place tonight. You know, maybe you've lost a dream Maybe you've had life push you down too far and you just don't even want to go back because it's hurting. Maybe you've achieved a dream and you're looking for a new one. Or maybe you just can't face the dreams that you have because you've been so hurt. You know, I'd love to ask if everyone just wanted to bow their head because, you know, dreams are the way that we create our futures. They're the way we step into tomorrow. And it's so important that we have them. It's so important that we're not scared to have dreams and to have big ones. And you know, right now, I'd just love to ask if you fall into any of those categories tonight, why don't you just raise your hand and let God know that you're ready to take up that dream. You're ready to take that next step. You're ready to see the bigger future that He has for you. And you're just ready and waiting to be inspired. If that's you in this place tonight, If you're ready for a new dream, ready for an old dream to come back. 
Father God, I just thank you for people in this place that are willing to dream, God. I thank you that you inspire in us and have given us the ability to create the future that we would like to see, God. I thank you that you have given us something so precious and that you love us so much, God. I pray right now that each person would be inspired, that their hearts would be set on fire for a passion that you have placed within them, God, that they would know that you can work miraculous things through that passion, God. And I thank you. I thank you for that. Amen. And maybe you're here tonight and I've been talking about God and I talked about uh, His plan, His dream for humanity. And that is that we would know that He loves us, that He gave His Son to die for us, that He has a dream that we would one day all know how much He loves us and that we would be with Him. And maybe you've never made a decision to follow God or you wouldn't say you even maybe believed in Him. But, you know, I think tonight hearing about the love and the kindness and the willingness of our God to work through our dreams, maybe something stirred in you, maybe something stirred in your heart and you would like to know more about God. And I just wonder if that's you in this place tonight and you just would like to start 2019 off with a fresh revelation, the revelation of God. I just wonder if while all our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you'd be brave and if you'd raise your hand, it's one of the most incredible decisions that you can ever make. And, you know, God steps with you every single part of the way. And so I'll just look across the room once more just to give everyone that, that opportunity for a fresh, a fresh start and a new beginning. Thank you, God. Amen. Um, if you'd all like to look up to the screen, why don't we take a moment to congratulate everyone who just made that decision tonight. And we're just going to take a moment to pray this prayer together. So if you made that decision for the first time or maybe you just made it in your heart, just speak these words with us and they mean just as much. So, dear Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Come into my life and I'll follow you. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you guys are encouraged to live 2019 as daydream believers. And that you're going to take that and run with it. And I'm just going to invite Jared and he's going to share a little bit more of the next step you can take if you made a decision tonight. So why don't we welcome him.